Hey, what's up guys? My name is Echerno, and welcome back to my C++ series. So today we're going to be talking all about timing. So how do we time how long it takes for us to complete a certain operation or execute certain code? That is what today's video is going to be about. Now, timing is useful for so many things, whether or not you want something to happen at a certain time, or if you're just kind of evaluating your performance or benchmarking and seeing how fast your code runs, you need to know how much time passes while your, while your application is actually running. And there are several ways to achieve this. Since C++11, we have something called Chrono. It's essentially, it's essentially part of the library that is that comes with C++, and it's not something that we actually have to go to the operating system library to actually do. Before, if you wanted a high resolution timer, meaning you wanted a very, very precise timer, you need to actually use the operating systems library. So in Windows, for example, we have something called Query Performance Counter. We can still use that stuff. And in fact, if you want a little bit more control of how you actually access that timing capability of your CPU, then you probably do want to use the platform specific libraries. However, today we're just gonna be taking a look at the kind of platform independent C++ standard library way of figuring out how long or how much time passes between our lines of code as they get executed. And that is part of the Chrono library. Now I've linked a, uh, a link in, in, in the description below to the actual CPP reference for this Chrono kind of API. Um, I'm gonna show you a very simple way of how we can set it up and start using it here so that we can figure out how long it takes us to run certain code. And I'll probably also show you one way in which it can be useful. Now, this whole video is going to be important for the future of this series because as we start integrating more kind of complex features and I start talking more and more about how to do things properly and how to write good performing code, we're going to be using timing to see that difference. So if I show you a kind of slow way of doing things and then I say, well, actually it would be better if we did it this way, you'll be able to actually see the difference in terms of how long it takes to actually run that code. So this is very important. From this, we'll probably branch into benchmarking and I'll talk more about benchmarking in another video and we can set up some kind of API so that we can time how long it takes to complete functions and arbitrary scopes of code probably as well. Uh, so yeah, pay attention to this video. Let's jump right into it and learn how we can time our code. So the first thing I'm going to do here is include Chrono. This contains pretty much everything we need. I'm also going to include Thread because we'll do some stuff with that in a minute as well. So from Chrono, it's very, very simple to actually use that library and figure out what the current time is. We can just type in STD Chrono high resolution clock. And then now this is what actually gives us the current time. If you hover over this, you can see it returns a time point of STD Chrono City Clock. It's quite a long type, which is why I'm just going to use auto and kind of label this as the starting time. We're then going to execute some kind of code here. What I'm going to do for now, because I don't actually have any other code to execute so that we can time, I'm just going to write std this thread sleep for, and then we'll just write one s for one second. And to get that, we'll actually have to use in namespace std literals and chrono literals to get that s there. Okay, cool. So basically what we're doing now is we're telling this thread, this current thread to sleep for one second. So we're saying just kind of pause, ex pause execution for one second. So obviously by writing this code, when we have our start and our end timing, we should see it be around one second. It probably won't be exactly one second because first of all, thread sleeps are not guaranteed to be exactly how much you tell it to sleep for, but also there'll be overhead from the actual timing. So if we get back into this, I'll write auto end, and this will be exactly the same as this start code here. And finally, we want to figure out the actual duration. So I'll write std chrono duration. Well, we can just get this in floats. That'll be high enough resolution for us. I'll call this duration and it will just be end minus start, just like that. We could have used auto here as well, but this type isn't quite as long, so it's fine to write it out. And finally, I'm just going to see out that into the console. Duration.count end line, and this will be in seconds, so I'll just add S to the end of that, so that's clear. And if I hit F5, you can see the number we get here is pretty much around one second. So that's it. What I just showed you is a platform independent way of actually figuring out how long something takes or how much time passes or getting the current time and all that. This Chrono library is fantastic. It's very high resolution timing and it works on pretty much all platforms. So really I recommend that you use this for all of your timing needs, unless you're specifically doing some kind of low level things or you want to reduce overhead even more. If you're running a huge game engine or some kind of core library, you might want to use the platform independent, uh, sorry, the platform specific 
libraries such as the Win32 API with the query performance counter and stuff. We might look into that in the future, but really there's pretty much no need for 99% of cases, just use STD Chrono. Now, if we dive back into this, I'm gonna show you a bit of a smarter way of actually dealing with this because you can see that this is quite a lot of code that we have to run. So support, suppose that we have a function, I'll call it function, and it does something. Like maybe it just prints, I don't know, hello to the console a bunch of times. So I'll just wrap this in a for loop and I'll say maybe it does that about a hundred times or something like that, right? So we have a for loop, it runs a hundred times. We wanna figure out, well, how long is this C out operation really? How long does it take C out to actually write stuff out to the console a hundred times? I wanna time this function. So what I could do at this point is copy start and end and do all of that stuff. That's a lot of work. I don't really wanna do that. So instead, I'm actually going to set up a very, very basic struct or class, doesn't matter. I'll just make this a struct called timer. And this will actually do everything for me. And what I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna use the whole object lifetime kind of paradigm to actually get it to basically automatically time everything for me. If you guys haven't checked out the video on object lifetime in C++, definitely do that. It's very, very useful. And in fact, this example, I'm pretty sure I did actually give in that video as well. So jumping back into our code, the constructor is going to actually start the timer. So I'm going to grab this and put it in here. Unfortunately, we can't actually use auto. So I'm going to have to figure out what the type is, which is std chrono time point, std chrono city clock. So std chrono time point std chrono steady clock so that's our kind of start just call this start and put it up here so we have our start and our end and i'll also grab this from here our duration and put this in as the duration start i'm going to assign to this in the constructor and in the destructor i'm going to copy this whole chunk of code here in the in the destructor what i'm actually going to do is write end equals the same thing and then finally duration and i mean you don't really have to store end as you can see because we're, we're really just after the duration but in case people want to access that maybe i want to kind of write that into my timer struct so duration equals end minus start and that will give us the duration in seconds of course okay and that's really all i need let's just make it even easier and say that we actually print the duration so we'll say timer took and then I'll write in duration seconds. Now, because this is such a quick operation, we actually might want to print the milliseconds instead. So I will say float ms equals duration dot count times 1000, which will give us the value in milliseconds. And I'll change this to be ms and this to be ms. Okay, cool. Sounds pretty good to me. That's pretty much all I need here. And now we have a basic struct that will basically do the timing and even print it out for us automatically. And it will of course do that upon destruction. All we really need to do is just create the object at the beginning of our function and that's, that's it. So over here in my function, the way I'm gonna do this is just type in timer timer like that. That's all I have to do and I'm done. This entire scope, this entire function will now be timed. So if I go back and delete all of this crap that I, that I don't care about, I'm just going to call function like that and we'll hit F5 and see what happens. Okay, cool, so check this out. We get hello printing 100 times to the console and at the very end, we see that this took 122 milliseconds. Cool, so we now know how long our code actually takes. 122 milliseconds, very, very slow. Let's see if we might be able to optimize this a little bit. So SED end line seems to be quite slow for some reason. So if we just get rid of that and actually put a backslash N into our print here inside our function, let's see how much faster this will be. And you can see over here that we've cut out about a third of our execution time. Obviously you should run this a few more times and in release mode if you actually care about benchmarking and all of that. But for now we can still see the difference. Anyway, that is a basic overview of timing in C++ and how you can time your functions and see how long it takes to execute certain code. Obviously this was a very, very rough example. I was just showing you how to actually use that timing API not how to actually perform benchmarks. We're gonna have a video all about that in the future. You can of course also use Visual Studio's profiling tools or whatever IDE you're using, whatever tool set you're using. A lot of tool sets do have profiling tools built in so you can actually automate a lot of this. This is more or less something called instrumentation where you actually modify your source code to contain kind of profiling tools such as this timing. That can be very, very useful because not all platforms you work with are going to have good enough profilers that don't add overhead. And this is a really simple way to do it. There are so many things that you can actually do from this. 
You can basically collect the data into like one big file and output it and read it in another tool so that you can see graphs or even like kind of a, a diagram of how long each function takes and what function that function calls. And there's so many things that will extend from this that we'll explore in the future. So definitely get excited about that. Very important that you start doing this if you do care about performance, since I imagine a lot of people watching this series are game developers or people who want to write game engines you need to be doing stuff like this all the time to actually see how fast your code performs. And since you are using C++ as a language, you're using C++ probably because you care about performance and you want to write fast code. So definitely get used to this kind of stuff. Anyway, I hope you guys enjoyed this video. If you did, you can hit the like button. You can also help support this series by going over to patreon.com forward slash the channel. Huge thank you as always to all of my patrons. This series would not be here without you. I can 100% guarantee that. So thank you so much. And I will see you guys in the next video. Goodbye.